Now, as we uh, continue in our service this morning, many of you know uh, we have been in a series all summer long going uh, through a series entitled FAQ, Frequently Avoided Questions. And uh, we've got a couple weeks left, but uh, this week uh, we have uh, the privilege of actually having a very special speaker with us, and his name is Donald Smith. Donald Smith is uh, the pastor over at Sylvania Community Church right across from uh, Northview High School. And uh, our topic this morning is you'll see on your worship uh, notes, uh, your sermon notes that are inside the worship guide, is what is God's heart towards racism and what should our response be? Now, I've gotten to know Donald uh, for uh, a lot, probably the most over this past year as I've uh, become the lead pastor here at this church. We've had many interactions on a district level, and I can remember at one of our network meetings just in our uh, prayer room that is over here off to the right, uh, we were sitting and talking, and Donald shared with us some of his testimony of growing up in the South and the issue of racism, and uh, it was moving for me to hear not only his experiences, but the transformation that God did in his heart in the midst of such hate. And uh, as we were preparing for this series and as a staff, we talked about wanting one of our topics to be about racism and how the church should respond. I thought of no better person to come, not only somebody that has experienced it firsthand, but really most importantly, someone whose heart has been transformed by God's word. And what I love about Donald Smith is he loves God's word and he wants his people to know it and to have it in their heart. And so we are blessed to have him come and share with us this morning. So would you please welcome my friend Donald Smith as he comes to share. Good morning, everyone. What an awesome privilege and a delight it is to be in your midst today. I'm honored to not only worship with you, but I'm honored that you would give me a hearing, especially on the topic that I have been asked to speak on. When uh, Pastor Rob asked me to come, my response to him was, if in the spirit of your invitation, you would diligently and earnestly pray that the Lord would glorify himself in my coming, I then would be delighted to come and allow the Lord to use me at Westgate. So to my brother Rob, thank you uh, for your invitation, and I want to commend you for your heart and your desire that the people of God hear the heart of God and display that heart to the world around you. Um, I, uh, I'm always reminded that I'm called to be salt and light in this world, and so are you. I want to, before I get started, present to you my bride of 49 years, three months, and 16 days, <laughs> Joyce. <laughs> Yeah, me too. Yeah, I, oh, I tell you, what a, what a blessing, what a blessing Joyce has been to me as we have grown together, as we've grown in the Lord. When we got married, we were just ex-kids. Um, we were not full grown-ups. We were only 20 years old, so I didn't consider myself, maybe I did then, but now I look back, I was not a full grown-up. I was just an ex-kid, so uh, I thank God that he has been with us. Uh, all these years and uh, how our love for one another has grown deeper and deeper and deeper to the point that when we look back, we see that what we had then was only puppy love. Uh, but it has gotten, and may I put it in the, in the vernacular of one of the uh, uh, members of uh, the First Alliance Church that I pastored, it's gotten gooder and gooder. The subject you're already aware of, what is God's heart toward racism, and what should our response be? Let me begin by sharing with you something that you do all the time. It's the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisibly, justice and liberty liberty and justice for all. Are we one nation? 
Yes, we are. Are we under God? Absolutely. Are we divided? Yeah. Is there justice for all? Well, I submit to you that the evidence is very clear that all do not share the same and enjoy the same justice in this country. But my job today is not to give you a history or uh, talk so much about America, even though we are very much a part of it. Uh, my job is to come alongside and encourage you, my brothers and my sisters, to reflect upon what God desires for the body of Christ, and that is unity. Christ prayed for it. The Word of God talks about it constantly. And I think that we need to really understand how we are to approach this. And when we deal with it in the world, not just in our family circles, we're going to face with all, be faced with all kinds of things. And I want to say this, that someone has truthfully said, rather comically, of course, the bestest of arguments will always result in the wrongest conclusion when the premise is false. Now, I know there's no word that, that, that's bestest. Uh, I'm a college graduate, so I, I know that, there is, that bestest is not an English word. Neither is wrongest. But humor me, the bestest of arguments will always result in the wrongest conclusions when the base of your argument is false. Always. And so I start with Colossians chapter, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, which says, For you know, well, who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person? which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. For their foolishness to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And so when we deal with any subject, whether it be a political matter or, or a matter pertaining to theology, we must always go to the believer's source of authority, which is the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. The Living Bible says it this way, The whole Bible was given to us by inspiration of God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and helps us do what is right. It is God's way of making us well-prepared at every point, fully equipped to do good to everyone. I wonder if I would ask someone to quote for me the number four of the CNMA seven core values. Now, I know anyone can stand up and, and quote that for me. Uh, but, but you know what? Instead of letting everybody get up at the same time, let me tell you what it says. <laughs> it says, knowing and obeying God's word is fundamental to all true success. Knowing and obeying God's word is fundamental to all true success. The world has its definition of, definition of success, but God has his definition of success. And the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ want to go by God's definition. And therefore, we apply his words to our lives. A man by the name of James Alexander wrote, 
The study of God's word for the purpose of discovering God's will is the secret discipline which has formed the greatest characters. And with that in mind, I want to ask you to do me a favor. Would you turn to the person sitting next to you and say these words, it's not about you. <laughs> and now say to them, it's not about me either. <laughs> it is true. It's not about you. It is not about me. It's not about Pastor Rock. It is about the Lord Jesus Christ and his body and his glory. And when we think in terms of what race is all about, we need to come to understand that from the authority that I hold in my hand, that there is only one race. Only one race. The term race as it is commonly used today, especially in America, is not a biblical term. It is an evolutionary construct which refers to a subspecies in the process of evolving into a new species. According to the choice, uh, I'm sorry, the concise Oxford Dictionary, the term racism refers to the belief that each race or ethnic group possesses specific characteristics, abilities, or qualities that distinguish it as either inferior or superior to another such group. Now, let's see what God's Word says. Genesis 1, says, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image. I don't see anywhere where it says, Let us make, mm, let's see, let's make a white man, and let's make a black man, and let, let's make an orange man, and let's make a green man. It says, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Not America's likeness, not Russia's likeness, but according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and every, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Please come with me, if you will, to Acts 17, 26. It says, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. And he, God, made from one man. The King James Version says, from one blood. And that one man is Adam. Genesis 3.20 says that Eve was the mother of all living. Now, if that be the case, I can greet every one of you and say, hello, cuz. <laughs> For we are cousins. Very distant, but we all came from Adam and Eve. And then after the flood, when, 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 when God couldn't stand things any longer, when he said that he was going to destroy all living things, he sent a flood upon the earth and, and he preserved Noah, <coughs> Noah's wife, Noah's three sons and their wives. And it says that from Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, that God populated the earth. Noah was the ninth generation from Adam. These are the three sons from which you and I came. And guess what? They all still had a sin nature. And so do you and I. Romans 5, 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread upon all men because all sin, that one man is Adam. 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 22 says, In Adam all die. And the fact that you and I all die says that we have a sin nature, says that we came from that one man, Adam, and the Bible says that it is because he brought sin into the world, you and I are sinners. And the last time I checked, the death rate among African Americans is 100%. The death rate among Italian Americans is 100%. The death rate among Irish Americans is 100%. The death rate among you name it is 100%. And unless the Lord Jesus Christ comes back first, you will die because 
of sin. We all have a sin nature. Malachi 2.10 says, Do we not all have one Father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously against each his brother? So our question is now, how did the church of Jesus Christ get to where it is in the matter of being divided over skin color? The number one reason I submit to you is that we have abandoned the Bible when it comes to the proper understanding of our origin for the purposes of our existence and even our morality, instead of interpreting the world by the Bible, the church has drifted into a point where it now looks to the world to explain the Bible. Sad. The church has stopped believing the Genesis account of our origin and has allowed evolutionists to tell us how the human race came into being. But the church needs to understand and keep it in mind that if the events of Genesis chapters 1 through 11 did not happen, there was no need for Christ to come. As a matter of fact, Christ's coming could not undo because the evolutionist standpoint is that death, disease, and destruction have always been part of the human race. The Word of God, my authority says, that death came into this world because of sin. Jesus came to undo what Adam and Eve did. And so if evolutionists are correct, then Jesus came for no good reason. Now, I know that there are many well-meaning believers who find great comfort in making the statement, well, I don't have anything against well, maybe this is just my preference, but isn't that what Eve did when she ate the fruit? This is my preference. Worship is not about you. It is about God. And the Bible never defines godly relationships as I don't have anything against the church of Jesus Christ is about the Lord Jesus Christ and his body. If you're in Christ, then you are a member of his body. Jesus wants the whole world to know about him. The Great Commission teaches that lost people matter to God. He wants them found. And Jesus said that the way the world will know that you belong to him is the love that you have one toward another. The love that he has commanded us to have. And everywhere I find in the Bible where the world, it's talking about love. Love is active. Love is action. Love is doing. You cannot define love by what it is. You can only define love by what it does. And there's no room for, I don't have anything against. Racism is a boast against God who created you. It is a boast against God who created you in the Bible, the word race is used 10 times. Once, it is referred to in Nahum, chapter 2. Yes, there's a book named Nahum. <laughs> but it's talking about chariots, a chariot racing. Three times as a reference to an activity such as an athletic contest. Six times in reference to people group, one about a holy race, one about a mongrel race, one about a Syrophoenician race, one about our race, one about the human race, and one is talking about a chosen race. If in two of the references, the writers are simply referring to people who do not belong to the covenant people, the Jews. Three references are to the covenant people, one to the human race, but in none of these references are the writers referring to skin color or physical features. Wherever there was even a prohibition against intermarriage, it was always a matter of keeping the religion or keeping faith in the one true God. It was keeping other religions from drawing the covenant people away from the worship of the true God. It was never on the basis of skin color, of physical features, or ethnicity. Therefore, we must understand that the Bible teaches that there is only one race. It is the human race. 
If race was a problem for God, why did he cause a non-Jew to be part of the line through which our Savior came? King David's grandmother, Ruth, was a Moabitess. She was not a Jew. So what qualified Ruth to be in the ancestral line of our Lord and Savior? It was her profession of faith. She, she spoke these words to Naomi. She said, for where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. That was the qualifier. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth is that we all were made in the image of God. But it is equally true that we all have fallen short of the glory of God. Some have repented and surrendered their lives to God so he can restore us to his original uh, go through faith in Jesus Christ. Some are still walking in darkness. But we need to understand that this matter of racism is against God. But not only is racism against God, it is irrational. It is irrational because skin color does not determine who will be a rapist or who will be a bank robber or a murderer, a wife abuser, a child molester. You can't look at someone have you seen on the news and somebody has committed a murder or done something in a certain neighborhood and, and, and somebody being interviewed says, well, I never thought that would happen in my neighborhood. Well, people live there. <laughs> <laughs> or she doesn't look like a bank robber. Huh? <laughs> and they're still making those excuse me, dumb statements. Just saying. <laughs> I'm reminded of so many things from my childhood. Oh, by the way, I need to say something to Pastor Rob. Uh, you gave me a time to finish the last time, but I forgot to look at, give you an exit for a time and look at the clock, so I can't really tell, so, so I just want to make sure I don't go over my two hours. Yeah, so, so you, have to, you have to keep me on track here. So uh, I don't know exactly when I'm supposed to finish, but, but at any rate, I'll, I'll make sure I don't go over two hours. I'm reminded of so many things from my childhood that actually caused me to hate white people. Yeah. For a long time, I hated white people. I don't know if any of you have heard the name Emmett Till. When Emmett Till was, was a 16-year-old boy that was, that was lynched not very far from where I grew up in Mississippi. And the reason he was lynched was because he was accused of whistling at a white woman. Of course, yes, that's during the time when they had the colored waiting rooms and the colored uh, water fountains and the, you know, the colored waiting rooms for the doctors and, and so forth, all of these things. Everything was separate. I remember during that time, around that time, a man pointing his finger in my face, in the face of my brother, and he said, boys, you had better say yes, sir, and no, sir, to me. And it was not because he was an adult and we were minors. He said very distinctly, because I am a white man. At that time, I swore I would kill him. That was B.C., before Christ. Different story today. One of the most irrational things I can think about is, is that when I was a child, I remember that even those who were in prison were segregated by skin color. It was as if to say that that, that murder victim that was killed by a white murderer was slightly less dead than the one who was killed by a black murderer. <laughs> irrational. Unless they both repented, they both were going to spend eternity not just for having murdered, but because they were sinners before they committed the murder and they did not accept Jesus Christ. I am so amazed at the irrationality of the things that I face. You see, the greater problem with racism is not its irrationality, but its sinfulness. In order to think lowly of some other person, you have to think highly of yourself. You have to think more highly of yourself than you ought to, and the Word of God warns us against that. 
Now, I know and I fully understand that racism existed long before 1859 when Charles Darwin published his book, The Origin of Species. However, that book fueled racism to the degree that it has made its way into our schools and in our churches, unfortunately. Your children are taught every day to believe in evolution. And by the way, evolution is a religion. They just won't admit it. We are people of faith and so are evolutionists. But I don't want to go too far on that. I've got to stay under that two hours. <laughs> the, the, the full title of that work by Darwin is On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Have you seen something like that surface in the last year or two? I mean, really out there? Well, we need to take action because those people are, 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 are growing in numbers and, and those people... Who are the favored races? And whose favor are we talking about? May we not forget that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was a Jew? And when we think back about something that has happened uh, in the last century where the Nazis attempted to exterminate the Jews, how many of you have thought about the reality that those ideas came from Darwinism? And we teach our children that every day in schools. And I would like to suggest to you that you take control and you say to your students that, yes, you have to put certain answers on your test papers in school, but you need to understand that the Word of God says this, that there's really only one race. It is the human race. And we all were made to bear God's image. I don't mean facial features. I'm talking character. We'll talk about it a little bit, little bit later. The Christian church in America has lost its foundation. It has lost its foundation. I'm reminded back in 1963, during the struggles of the African Americans for civil rights, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote uh, what is famously called Letter from Birmingham City Jail. Because eight Alabama clergymen whose skin color was not like mine publicly criticized the nonviolent efforts of civil rights activists to gain equal rights. Although much progress has been made since that time, the church is still practicing, to a very large degree, racism. The church can't legitimately hold to Darwinism and claim to walk in the light of God's word at the same time. How do I know when my thoughts about a group of people are not aligned with God's heart? How do I know when I have a racist thought? It is whenever I judge a person or a group of people on the basis of their skin color or ethnicity. When I judge a political party or activity, rather, not on the basis of God's truth of right and wrong. And please know I did correct that party to activity. It is when I judge an activity, not on the basis of what's right and wrong, but on the basis of skin color, then my thoughts are racist. When I refuse to become part of a local faith community because the skin color of the leader is not like yours or mine, that is racism. When I refer to a church as a white church or a black church, that may or may not be racism, but it is definitely ignorance. Newsflash! I am not a black Christian. That is not an apology for what I am. For God made me who I am. And as a matter of fact, uh, my skin curl is actually a very pleasant chocolate. <laughs> and my wife loves it. <laughs> and if you will hold up a piece of paper next to your face, you might see that you're not white. <laughs> J just saying. <laughs> But why do I say that? The minute I put that adjective, black 
or white in front of Christians. I am redefining what it means to be a follower of Christ, and I refuse to define my Christianity that way. When I do that, I am actually dishonoring the cross on which our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty for my sins. Jesus didn't die to raise up black Christians. Jesus didn't die to make white Christians. <laughs> Did you not know that Jesus didn't even die so much to turn you from a bad person to a good person? Jesus died because you were dead. And he died so that you could live. He died to give us life. And he died to give us life so that we could reflect his image in the world. After all, we were made to be in God's image. So he died that. So when Christ died on the cross, he died so that he could bring us into a right, loving relationship with himself and with God the Father. And if you all, you and I are in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, then that makes us in relationship with one another. And we need to keep that in mind as we go through our lives. Understand this. If our horizontal relationships are not in order, then neither is our vertical relationship. I uh, want to reflect very briefly on a passage of Scripture which the Apostle Paul wrote to the saints at Colossae. We'll find that in Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, he says, Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. And so I say once again, it's not about you. It is about Christ and his cross. But notice what the Apostle Paul said to another congregation of followers as he wrote to, uh, to them in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17. He says, therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And because I am in Christ and he is in me, it is by his standard that I live. And so I say to you again, I'm not a black Christian. I'm a Christian who happens to be black. And I praise God for who I am. All glory belongs to him. Let me suggest to you, and what I'm about to say, I picked this up probably a couple of decades ago. I cannot remember where I got it from. Otherwise, I'd give that person credit for it. But I don't want to be guilty of plagiarism. This is what I'm about to say. The character of the God determines the character of the worshiper. The character of the God determines the character of the worshiper. Someone has said that worship is supreme adoration, which results in imitation. In other words, whatever your God is like, if you really want to worship that God in the truest sense, you want to seek to imitate that God in his character. If your God happens to be the God of lies, then telling the truth would be an abomination before that God. Therefore, to honor the God of lies, you need to try to be the biggest liar you can possibly be. But because our God is a God of love, Ephesians 5, 1 says, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love. And so if we're going to worship our God the way he wants us to worship him, then it has to be in love. As a matter of fact, it is his commandment. Love one another just as I have loved you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was not a suggestion. It was a commandment by our God. And we need to be about the business of doing that. Our God's character is love. Our God's character is holiness. And God desires to produce his character in us. This is why he's given us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit produces his fruit in our lives. And the first thing on the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. And again, I say to you, love is not defined by what it is. It is defined by what you do. 
Racism is tantamount to criticizing God's choices in his creation. And if God chose to make people of various skin colors, and he said, said it's very good, what right do you and I have to criticize it and then elevate myself above it or reduce myself beneath it? Honor God for who he is. We're all saved by grace, which is, in my view, is still amazing. It is still amazing that God would love me, that God would love you. I am amazed in his love. If Jesus said that the way the world will know that you belong to him is through the love you show one another. If Jesus prayed to the Father in John 17 for unity among the disciples so that the world would know that the Father loves them and that the Father sent him, if after laying out the rich mercy of God, the, the Father, and his amazing grace by which each of us is saved so that none of us can boast about our worthiness to be saved, the Apostle Paul could write these words, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit then it has to grieve God's heart to see division within the body of his son who went to the cross to redeem us from our sins it has to break God's heart when we do not display the unity that is demonstrated even within the unity or the trinity of the Godhead when God spoke from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, I believe that one of the reasons he said that was because when he looked upon the Lord Jesus Christ, he saw reflection upon himself. The reason God was so pleased with David, King David, was because David, in God's own words, was a man after God's own heart. And he wants you and me to be men and women after his heart. So if love and unity within Christ's body is what God wants, then racism and division are the work of the devil. Keep in mind that Jesus spent much of his time with those who were considered outcasts of society. So then, what should the church of Jesus Christ do? Second Chronicles 7, 5, 14 says, And my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. So the first thing is simply repent. 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 Do not get bogged down in, 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 in just talk or just what is so-called racial reconciliations discussions that go nowhere. Just do it. And yes, I heard that somewhere else too. <laughs> Number two, stop allowing the culture to set the tone for how the church of Jesus Christ should live. Romans 12, 2 says that, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Sometimes when you're in a setting, when you're in a culture where a certain thing has been tolerated for so long, it seems not only natural, it seems like the way things ought to be. And so the Apostle Paul writes to those after telling them, I urge you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. And then he says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Stop thinking the way the world thinks and think the way God would have you think and renew your mind so that you may prove what is that good and perfect an acceptable will of God. Number three, be imitators of God. Number four, do everything you can to promote unity within the body of Christ. Jesus prayed for it. The apostle Paul taught on it. So we need to do it. The gospel goes beyond our own local assembly. Number five, be the salt and light you're called to be. And number six, begin to pray for our nation. Core value number two of, our, of the Christian Mission Alliance is prayer is the primary work for the people of God. Prayer is the primary work for the people of God. In prayer, you not only receive what God wants you to do. In prayer, you actually receive God's heart. You don't just give God a list of things. God gives you a list of things, and he plants them in your heart. I want to finish with this. 
My wife and I moved to Ohio in 2014. We were asked to come uh, in order to pastor the church where we are now. And in our search to buy a house, there was a man that refused to sell us a house. Our realtor, whose skin color is like most of you, knows the realtor personally. She also knows that he saw us when we told her, toured the house. And she said to us, you did not get a response from him because he saw the color of your skin. And she said, I think you should sue him. Our response simultaneously was, God did not send us to Ohio for those kinds of battles. God sent us to Ohio to show people and to tell people about the love of God. And so we said, we're not going to be involved in that. Why did I tell you that? Get sympathy from you? Not at all. I tell you that because I want you to be reminded in case you, it's passing right over you, racism is very alive and well in our nation. It is saddest when it's alive and well among people who name the name of Christ. But I also share that with you is that I cannot teach you about loving unless I'm willing to demonstrate it in my own life. So I can stand here without feeling of contradiction by the Holy Spirit that if I were to, be, 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 to see this man today, I would welcome him with open arms. I would love him because I right now absolutely have absolutely no grudge against him whatsoever. Donald Smith before Christ would have had a totally different attitude. But now Christ is my Lord, and he decides, not the world. I cannot allow that person to determine how I'm going to love. I have to allow the Lord to teach me how to love. And so I share that with you in hope that you will understand the importance of this. And I hope I have this just time to share this with you. Revelation 5, 9 through 14 says, and they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them. I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. In the end, ladies and gentlemen, Worship of God the Father and the Lamb will be the only thing that will matter. And since what we do on Sunday mornings is like a dress rehearsal for what's to come, let's get it right down here. Let's get it right down here. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we are so grateful for your great and awesome love toward us. Thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ who stepped out of eternity into the time, space, and history of mankind to redeem us from the sins that, you have, that, that we have committed against you. Only a good God would do that. Surely you love us not because you like what we are, but in spite of. Thank you for loving us, O oh God, and thank you for, for, for making us members of your family. We have been adopted, O oh God, through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you that you've given us this awesome privilege of calling you our Father. And you look upon us and call us your children. We praise your holy and your righteous name. And we thank you. Now we pray that you would cause us to live like it. In Jesus' name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it.